<laughs> but welcome to the virtual stewardship advisory committee meeting. Uh, okay, why is it not advancing? <laughs> um, patience is the order of the day, I guess. Nice picture of Mort, uh, Mort. Yes, many of you will recognize Mort Mosswild, who is now the field team leader. Uh, that was a few years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the beard's a lot longer now. Um, <laughs> Greg, I may need some assistance. <clears throat> My, yep. uh, if you start it again. And I'm not sure which, if it's the, yeah, you know, from the beginning. Well, and I just, can't, if it's the arrow keys. Yeah. Okay, there we go. All right, moving on, the agenda. Uh, I'm going to welcome you, explain a little about, a bit about the role of the committee. Um, then we're going to hear some brief remarks from Patty Cormier, uh, the director of the Maine Forest Service. Then Don Mancius will speak a little bit about um, the update of Maine's Forest Action Plan. Uh, if we're on task by 9.30, uh, we'll hear from Peter Berenger from the US Forest Service about the modernization of the Forest Stewardship Program. And uh, hopefully Jerry Barnes will come on next uh, from NRCS with a quick update on forestry items uh, at NRCS. We'll take a break. Um, come back with a brief preview of the new or under construction B Woodswise website. Uh, Greg Lord will give us a, a glimpse of that, and then um, do a we'll get a preview of the uh, Woodswise Project Canopy Invasive Plants Control Program, uh, which we still need to come up with a better acronym. But anyway, uh, this is something that is in the early planning stages and um, will be designed to help Maine woodland owners uh, deal with invasive plants in their woods. And then the last hour, hour and 10, 15 minutes will be the round robin sharing where everybody uh, that has uh, a few minutes, uh, will get a few minutes to just say what they or their organization has been doing in the realm of stewardship here in Maine. Uh, we'll wrap it up uh, shortly before noon and at noon, it'll be time to travel back to your living rooms, yeah. your kitchens, or wherever else you go when, after you get off of virtual meetings. Uh, and as I mentioned before, please uh, stay muted and uh, with your video off during the presentations. Um, if you need to, Greg, is there a raise hand function? And, and where do people find it? Yeah, so there is. If everyone can see it, it would be on that kind of floating bar at the bottom of your screen, sort of. There's a part of the bar, there's three dots, and just to the right of it, there's a hand. And so you'd click on that to raise your hand, and in the list of participants next to your name would show that raised hand. Okay. Um, yeah, so if there's uh, something you really need or, or would like to share, uh, you can do that. But we're going to try to give, try to stay on the uh, agenda as much as possible and save discussion for that last hour. So briefly, the role of this committee, uh, which um, we sometimes we hope to meet annually, but it doesn't always work out that way. Uh, this helps to coordinate with partners, partners, and you're all partners in uh, stewardship here in Maine, uh, coordinating to improve the, the program delivery, uh, providing an opportunity to offer comments and suggestions. And I should mention the chat window too, feel free to use that. Uh, with comments or, or things of that nature, although we'll again wait probably towards the that last hour before we Four respond. And then uh, not to mention that it is part of the uh, stewardship grant requirement to hold such meetings. So I'll quickly go through goals for the meeting and then mute myself. Uh, we want to keep you folks informed about the forest stewardship and Be Woods Wise programs, uh, update the, the um, or, or inform you about the update of the state forest action plan. Again, gather input from you folks, share ideas, learn from each other, and even possibly have fun. I uh, just want to mention that the uh, web page um, 
link. There is a web page for this committee. It's got a lot of the uh, past committee uh, content uh, presentations and so oh, on and so I'll forth. And also um, there is a link there to a survey that um, is another way to provide input. I just want to mention that we'll be updating that as we move from the old survey monkey into something called forms. Um, OK, so I've stopped sharing. And so next on the agenda is Patty. Patty, um, do you want to at least turn your camera on so folks can see you? And on mute. How's that? OK, we see you. Hey, everybody. Hey, um, thanks. Thanks for being here today. It's great to see everybody. And thanks for agreeing to um, to be on this today. Andy has put together a crackerjack group of people. We um, we've got landowners and conservation district representative, logger representative, foresters, land trusts, federal and state partners, Audubon. Some of the most thoughtful and mindful people I know, so I really appreciate you being here. So I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Maine has around 5 million acres um, owned by small landowners with under 1,000 acres. And the average lot size is still trending downward. So every one of those landowners has a different reason for owning their piece of Maine. And every landowner has a different motivation for what um, what we say is managing their land. And there's so many, so many reasons to manage, so many variables to owning woodlots. And think about um, think about nowadays with the pandemic. Maybe those reasons are are changing. So. This is where I think, um, well, I know forest stewardship comes in. So the the first uh, stewardship or the forest stewardship program is a partnership with the U.S. Forest Service to engage landowners to meet them where they are in their spectrum of motivation of owning their land, to speak to their language and to their pace for their woodlot. When I first uh, started with the Forest Service almost 22 years ago, I think the first week we had a, a stewardship advisory meeting in Brewer, and there must have been, I'd say, 60 people there. Maybe Merle remembers, but there was a lot of people there. Were you there, Harold? Can't say I remember. Okay, that was a that was a full room. And at that point, we were right deep into the ice storm funding. And obviously then the conversation was a little different as it, as it is now. So then, since then, there have been a few iterations of uh, stewardship programs leading us today with Be Woods Wise under Andy's leadership. So the, you know, the underlying framework of any of these programs is the delivery of information for landowner education and professional technical assistance. So you guys today are, you know, you have a very important role, which is to provide um, recommendations concerning the implementation and development of programs and priorities. And really, um, we we welcome your thoughts. Be creative. Any ideas you have, and think about again where we are today with the with all that's going on, the pandemic and stuff. I think back to the um, to the many landowners I've walked with over the years, and forest stewardship. The programs really um, were part of the big part of the conversation. Maybe the landowners didn't go with any of the programs, but it really um, provided a um, an opening into their conversation about what they could do. And <clears throat> one of the best programs was um, was it forestry forest for the birds um, with Audubon. 
And what I get out of that was the stewardship programs and talking about and, you know, a lot of the motivation of folks enrolling in that program was um, wildlife habitat, bird habitat. But the conversation always got into the management part. And the forest stewardship programs had a big part in that conversation. So um, I really, I really look forward to what comes out of today. And and I can't say enough thank you for uh, for being here and you're taking your time. It's a beautiful day. And again, I look forward to seeing what you guys have to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Patty. Um, next, Don Mancius. Don, if you're ready to share your screen and talk about the uh, update to the Forest Action Plan. Yeah, give me one sec here. Sure. And again, appreciate everyone's patience. We're still, this is still not the second nature way of doing things. <laughs> so. I have a trivia question while he does that. So who, who wrote, I took a walk in the woods and came out taller than the trees? Nobody? Mr. Thoreau. Ah, that guy. Can everybody okay. see this? There it is. All right, great. Like, Take it away. Okay. So, uh, just going to talk briefly about Maine's Forest Action Plan. Uh, we're up for our. Uh, second round through the spin cycle on this uh, our first plan came out in 2010 and uh, it's posted on the main forest service website if you want to read it the uh, farm bill requires the state agent forestry agencies to develop and submit a statewide forest assessment talk about the trends conditions and trends of forest resources threats to forest lands identify priority forest areas and um, any multi-state areas that are regional priorities uh, in Maine. One example would be the uh, land covered by the former Northern Forest Lands Council across northern New England and New York. And we also have to develop a statewide forest resource strategy, identify strategies for addressing the threats to the forest resources, uh, and uh, describe or discuss the resources needed to uh, address these issues. And uh, the second round we have to complete by December of this year to remain eligible to re receive cooperative forestry assistance funds. That includes forest stewardship, uh, urban and community forestry, and uh, some uh, forest health and some of the fire programs. So uh, I'm not going to read all these. Uh, I'll be happy to send my presentation to Andy and he can ship it out to folks. But basically, uh, the idea of the forest action plan is to come up with strategies to address uh, what the state identifies as priorities for the state's forest resources, how it's going to invest uh, federal and, and other resources, uh, come up with a timeline, uh, talk about how we're going to uh, monitor what happens and uh, adapt as necessary. So we have to address three priorities that are identified by state and private forestry uh, at the U.S. Forest Service. That's conserve and manage working forest landscapes, protect forests from threats, that's all threats, and enhance the public benefits that come from trees and forests. Now, so this is just uh, showing the process uh, leading out of the state assessment and strategy. Skip over that. So the outline for the forest action plan, a uh, little bit of an introduction why we have to do this. Uh, a section on addressing forest condition and trends. 
identify the issues, threats, and opportunities, uh, the priority landscape areas, uh, the statewide forest strategy, and then a bunch of appendixes, including the forest uh, legacy assessment of need. So the uh, criteria that we use uh, for uh, describing the forest condition and trends are uh, the state's criteria for sustainability. Uh, you can read them all there. There's nine of them. And then this is the uh, the current uh, list of issues, threats, and opportunities uh, that we're looking at supporting uh, strong forest products industry, active management, promoting outcome-based forestry, uh, keeping the main forest lights on at the main forest service, uh, taking care of forest health and uh, resiliency of Maine's forests. And uh, in these threats include uh, climate change, of course, uh, being able to model future forest conditions, uh, conserving forests for uh, healthy, you know, clean water and healthy fisheries, uh, taking care of our urban and community forests. And uh, the last one that we've identified in 2010, and I think we'll keep identifying it, is the ongoing erosion of federal support for our cooperative forestry programs. Just to show you an idea of what uh, one of the priority forest area maps looks like, this is from the 2010 plan. Uh, we identified the important uh, family forest areas. Uh, those are highlighted in green. And you can see the uh, you know, Baxter Park and some of the public ownerships are clipped out. And uh, you can see the urban areas uh, like Portland. Uh, but there's still, you know, a big uh, spread of uh, important forest areas for the family woodland owners uh, right across the southern third of the state and up along the east side of Aroostook County. So for each uh, strategy that we identify to address any of those issues, uh, we identify where they, the strategies would apply, the uh, all the programs that would contribute to helping us uh, address uh, the strategies, the key stakeholders important uh, to help us implement the strategies, uh, discuss the resources that are available or required to implement the strategies, uh, those three, which of those three national objectives the strategies address, the sustainability criteria that they uh, address, and uh, what are the measures of success. And it all comes down to money. Um, I just threw this slide in at the last second to uh, show you what's been happening to the forest stewardship program over the last uh, 18 years. The, uh, we were getting up around 300,000 a year back in the early 2000s, as you can see. And then it took a nosedive about 10 years ago. And we've been pretty much flat funded uh, wavering around 150,000 a year ever since. So we're in the step process of uh, finalizing a draft for internal review. Then we will go out for public comment. We'll put it out to the Forest Service for their review. They have a uh, checklist that they need to go through to make sure that our plan is sufficient. And then we'll look for final adoption at the end of 2020. And if anybody has any questions, I'll take them now. Yeah, if you have um, a question for Don, just uh, unmute. And if otherwise, I would ask folks to uh, make sure you're muted and also have your video off because that makes it a little hard on the speaker, on seeing the speaker. So, Harold, Joe, <laughs> unless you have questions for Don. Uh, th this is Sally. I have a quick question for you, Don. I noticed in the list of priorities that um, 
water quality water quality and fisheries is listed but there's nothing in there about wildlife or wildlife habitat is that something that could be added to the list yes yes it could that'd be great okay any other questions for don I have I have one, Andy. This is Teresa. Go ahead. Hi, Teresa. Um, hi, Don. Is there any way to? I'm sure it's covered in the support for forest products businesses, but is there any way to give a little bit more um, attention to the local woodworks goals that we've talked about in the past? Uh, you know, one one of our hopes was that we could have some criteria eventually for um, buildings that were constructed, you know, with state funds to, to at least be looking at um, using main products as part of that construction process, at least in, the, in yep. one of the initial bids. That's a good idea. Be happy to plug that in. Okay, thank you. Okay, anybody else? Comments or questions for Don or about the action plan, the, far, the state forest action plan? Seeing none, uh, Mr. Berenger, are you about ready to go? I can be. Okay. Wait a second. Um... So can everybody hear me? And you should be seeing a, a screen that says something about modernizing the forest stewardship program. Yes, I see it. Very good. Yes. So thanks, Andy. Um, it's nice to see so many uh, familiar names and, uh, and, and faces. Um, uh, for those who don't know me, I am. Uh, my name is Peter Berenger, and I'm the Landowner Assistance Forester for the USDA Forest Service out of the uh, Eastern Region State and Private Forestry. My office is in uh, Durham, New Hampshire. Um, right now I'm uh, in the great state of Maine. Um, and uh, I work with the uh, uh, landowner assistance foresters like Andy in the six New England states and, uh, and New York. And Andy asked me to talk a little bit about the changes to the uh, forest stewardship program. And so I'll quickly go through this agenda and uh, have some time at the end for any questions or uh, discussion that you might want to have. Uh, as most of you know, I uh, work for the uh, great state of Maine up until about uh, four years ago. And I got this opportunity to work with the Forest Service. And uh, so for the last four years or so, I've been working um, uh, with the uh, with, with this program. And uh, there's been a lot of change. Um, the uh, the what was the northeastern area has been dissolved and uh, merged into what's now the eastern region. Um, the the programs will remain the same essentially, but uh, a lot of the people changed and uh, the office in uh, uh, Newtown Square, Pennsylvania was closed and there were about 75 people in that office and they all decided to go and work someplace else except for one. One moved from uh, Newtown Square to Milwaukee. Um, so. Uh, uh, as recently as about last week, um, they've just recently hired the uh, the staff to fill all those vacancies, and uh, Caroline Keebler has been hired to be the regional coordinator for this program. And hopefully, at some time in the future, uh, everybody will get a chance to meet her. Um, so uh, a lot of a lot of change. Uh, Andy already touched on 
kind of why the committee is convened. It's a, it's one of the uh, requirements of the of the grant. But I throw this up there uh, because uh, people say, you know, why are we changing the program? And uh, the the focus of the program has always been kind of on uh, plans and acres. And the reason why it's been on plans and acres and management plans is because the enabling legislation says you're going to build, uh, you're going to write management plans, and th that's how you're going to measure uh, accomplishments. So the, uh, the forest stewardship program is one of the favorite programs of the state foresters. They love it. Um, and one of the reasons why they love it is because of its flexibility. Um, each state uh, can tailor the program to meet their state needs. Um, and so it's also been one of the uh, challenges because because each state tailors it to meet their needs, uh, the, the rolling up and telling a consistent national story has been somewhat of a challenge. And you can see here uh, some of the you know, 25.8 million acres uh, of plans, uh, 200,000 uh, uh, plans. And uh, one of the ones I'll point out is the, uh, the, the private sector jobs for consulting foresters. Um, but even with the success of the program, uh, funding over time, and I appreciate Don's uh, slide from and, and talking about the uh, erosion of federal dollars. Um, the, the, the forest stewardship program is, is essentially half of what it was uh, not that many years ago. Um, and uh, Don's slide uh, certainly showed a better uh, image of, uh, of the trend over time. Um, a lot of the causes for the decline has been um, uh, other priorities, um, forest health issues, uh, wildfire. Out, uh, they actually borrowed some of the funds for fire uh, to, to put out uh, fires in the West. I'll skip over that. See, there's been a little blip up in the last couple of years. So again, the the program's changing. The, uh, uh, the the state foresters and the forest service went to the appropriators and said, "How can we get more money into the forest stewardship program? It's a program that we love." And uh, the Senate said, well, and offered these suggestions. Um, they said you should consider developing outcome based reporting and they question how the, the funds get allocated to the states. And over the last three plus years, the Forest Service and the state foresters have been working to come up with a way to respond to these uh, to the appropriators uh, comments. The folks that have been working on this came up with uh, these goals here. Um, they uh, the program is going to focus on the the basics: water, wildlife, fire, and jobs. Uh, one of the bigger contentious issues. Uh, they're going to focus uh, and develop a priority area, uh, which can only be 50% of the total eligible lands. You remember back to Don's map there, looking at all the lands. Um, and uh, coming up with what half of that is going to look like somewhat of a challenge. Um, they want to develop tools to uh, maximize technical assistance, leverage partnerships, and uh, we have to come up with um, this monitoring uh, protocol to do a better job of uh, rolling up all these accomplishments and demonstrating uh, program success. This is just kind of a, a quick look at the uh, changes to the formula that they're proposing. And a greater emphasis on performance. 
raising that performance element from 45 to 60 percent and including a little bit more uh, categories. So the landowner education and assistance becomes a bit a bigger factor. And this is just kind of looking at the, the accomplishment, accomplishment metrics that are in the formula. Currently, just those three, and then broadening it out. And uh, so all plans will now count, not just for stewardship plans. Not just because of the uh, COVID pandemic, but uh, many of the um, originally proposed deadlines have, have been adjusted. Um, everybody's kind of struggling to uh, to meet all the deadlines. Um, but we're certainly hoping to have the uh, priority areas uh, designated uh, here the end of August. And then the uh, monitoring protocols and tools will all be developed for uh, hitting the ground running for the beginning of the federal fiscal cycle, which is uh, October. So next steps, got to get uh, the priority area. 50% um, is uh, a big challenge for many states. Uh, programmatically figuring out how to keep the expenditures within focused within the priority area. And uh, the monitoring tool uh, is being developed and um, uh, Andy's active in the dialogue uh, developing it, but then there'll need to be some training and figuring out how to get everybody up to speed using it. And, uh, and again, then figuring out how to take all this new data and roll it up and try to tell a better story uh, in hopes of uh, getting additional support uh, in terms of a uh, larger appropriation for the program. And that about wraps it up. Does anybody have any questions? I have a question. This is Sally Stockwell. Um, I noticed that the acreage is still set at 10 acres, anything 10 acres or above for um, these stewardship programs. Was there any discussion about, in terms of prioritization, focusing on those properties that may be a little bit larger, particularly in Maine, where we have more forest land perhaps than in some other, or larger lots than in some other places? Andy, I didn't know if you wanted to answer that, but uh, I will say that uh, other states like Vermont minimum acreage is uh, 25 acres and that will certainly be one way to um to prioritize uh yeah um just want to say that whoever the guest is if you could turn off your your black uh, screen we could see the rest of p <laughs> <laughs> somebody is in as a guest and they must have their video on, but something blocking their camera because what we're getting is a black screen. So, Andy, that's me, Joe Dembeck here, and I've got a I've got a broken computer camera that's staying on. I noticed. Ah, uh, can you? So I can I can turn it to the side. And you can see an empty room, but I can't shut it off. You can't. Okay. Well, um, I don't know. Is there, Greg, is there a way that uh, that can be done from this side? Uh, there is not, no. No, okay. Well, is, Pete, is there a way, could... is there a way for Joe just to call in rather than um, join via computer? That might solve the problem. Hmm. Or the other thing, is it, is it a uh, separate camera plugged into the computer? Or is it no, Greg, it's part of the laptop. And okay. 
Hmm. Well, at least at least now we're seeing you instead of a black <laughs> nothing. Uh, <laughs> I know. So, What's better? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, anyway, just want to make sure we can see Pete. So Pete, maybe if you scooch to your right a little bit. There you go, right there, right there, good. Okay, so getting back to the question um, of changing the, the lower limit of eligibility, uh, I suppose there, it, it's an idea worth some consideration. Um, I do find that quite a few of uh, the WoodsWise plans we, we are handling, as far as that goes, are on lots smaller than 25 acres. Uh, there's a lot of folks with with those small lots. I personally think that stewardship is as much or more about people than it is about the land. I mean, it's, it's about both, but I would really hate to uh, cut out people uh, who might be very, very active, very engaged, or potentially that way, just because they had less than 25 acres. However, uh, as you see, our resources aren't what they used to be, and they may get worse. So that's a decision we might have to make. But for the time being, um, as we work through the process of that 50 percent, uh, we'll wait and see where we are going, still maintaining that 10 acre minimum. Uh, we do have a thousand acre maximum uh, so that. Um, again, that's that's an audience that we reach through stewardship, figuring that uh, landowners with more than that should be in a position to. It's not that the main forest service isn't there to help, but the forest stewardship program is not particularly geared to helping them get engaged. Um, larger landowners probably already have more of a focus on their woodlands and hopefully more resources to work with foresters and and do good management. Yeah. Andy, let me just add that the the educational opportunities for landowners can exist statewide and be distributed statewide. It's the specific planning, uh, technical assistance uh, for, for management plan development that is supposed to be focused within that uh, priority area. Yeah. So could I just ask, this is more, does the priority area have to be geographically defined or would that, would establishing a different acreage threshold, would that satisfy the the intent to create a priority area. Could you create a priority area that says it's statewide, but it just includes landowners with larger acreage? Exactly what I was thinking, Mort. The the issue is is uh, they're requesting that you develop a, a map, and unless you have those acreage um, um, lot li uh, plot lines for everybody's um, ownership. You won't be able to develop a a map. So we uh, still have to come up with a ge geographic area that identifies the yeah. priority area, quote unquote. Yeah. So in the in the old world, we could have a what we would call a community of interest, um, uh, people who were about to cut or harvest, and they would self-identify and become part of the group, and we would uh, work with them. Uh, under the new rubric, communities of interest uh, aren't eligible. It's all about communities of place. So I got a question um, relating to the funds. I mean, we access an awful lot of the Woodswise funds. I guess where is the pinch point in the money? Because I've never been turned down, or our clients have never been turned down. I've never been told that funds are even tight. Um, where is the, who's <laughs> not getting paid? Well, uh, luckily, uh, we haven't had to actually say no to anybody based on lack of funds. As you saw the, uh, the graph, we've had enough to meet our demand. Um, Harold, you, you and your, and two trees forestry have been a big part of that demand and we appreciate that. Uh, it's, when you say funds haven't been tight, you probably just haven't seen me sweat yet. Uh, we're watching it every year, and every year it's another, until we get the allocation, 
uh, we, we can't be absolutely certain that we're going to be able to keep doing business as we've been doing it. Uh, so far, we're we're staying we're staying in the game. Um, the the issue of the priority area, uh, we're going to try to minimize the impact of that on places where we know that we have interest and where uh, folks such as yourself are are helping to bring bring people to the program. Um, but it still remains to be seen how that will play out. Uh, certainly want to encourage that everybody on the call who doesn't work for state government, I believe, would be in a position to contact your uh, elected representatives and tell them what you think about um, the fire stewardship program and where it's going. I think I'm allowed to say that, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, Dan, uh, you have your hand raised. Can you hear me, Peter? Yeah. OK, so this is a question for maybe a combination of you and Andy, but um, I noticed one of your slides had uh, proposed performance measures for the state allocations. And uh, within that, there was under the proposed um, measures was equip. And I'm just kind of wondering as to what would you be uh, looking for for equip? Uh, how, how would that be tracked? And um, could, I don't have, a, in my district, I don't have a lot of direct involvement and in implementation for EQIP, but I do refer landowners to NRCS if I think that one of their programs is a good fit. Um, so I, I just wonder if what I'm doing is going to be usable uh, for that performance measure. So the, the challenge will be that in order for it to be kind of in the mix, they're hoping to have it be um, uh, identified as a part of uh, like a point on the landscape. And oftentimes with equip plans, uh, our involvement is such that it it's part of what's done in NRCS and we don't have access to that. Um, working with uh, Jerry Barnes, we, we've been able to get some of that data. Um, and it does go into the accomplishment reporting that exists today. What's different is going to be that it's um, it's going to be used in the formula um, to allocate the funds. Um, so traditionally it's been reported, but difficult to get the data. Um, in the new world, it's going to be part of the allocation form. So it'll be more important in the future to be able to get that data if possible. So I get maybe the bottom line on my question is what can I do to make sure that that I'm reporting it correctly so that it it helps the state of Maine with the allocation? Well, uh, uh, my answer for that, Dan, would be keep doing what you're doing and the uh, the education, the um, educational programs that you help put on. Uh, they they are part of that uh, performance as well, and the one on one assistance, the walk and talks, and and uh, responding to, you know, calls to take a look at a harvest. So reporting all that, it definitely uh, will make a difference. Um, uh, again, we have collected that, uh, but now it may have a, a different a different impact on things depending on how that national allocation goes forward and then how that's broken up among the regions. So there are some a lot of steps along the way, but basically just you know keep track of, of all the um, contacts that you have and the impact that you have with uh, with our woodland owners, you know, the target audience. And that's that's a good thing. In terms of uh, the effect of uh, NRCS programs, um, since NRCS and US Forest Service are all part of the Department of Agriculture, one would hope that there'd be a way to um, get that information. Uh, one would hope. <laughs> um, but in the meantime, Jerry Barnes has been helpful in, in at least giving giving me a number of plans and acres uh, for um, NRCS's forest management plans, the CAP 106s. So we've been able to do a little something informal, but I don't know if that's still going to be enough. Um, 
kind of a would be a good segue to introduce uh, Jerry Barnes, but I don't think he's on yet. He is next in the agenda, but he did um, email me earlier that he had to be on a call at nine and he was going to get off as soon as he could. So I told him that I would work him in whenever whenever he got here. So I guess Andy, that means we Andy, can this still is have Sally. a discussion with Peter. Yeah, uh, great. This is Sally. I have another question for you, Peter. Um, I was on, uh, based on comment you made, Andy, that maybe we could get in touch with our senators and tell them what we think about the direction the stewardship program is going. Does is is there still room to adjust some of the criteria and for the ranking or is that pretty much done? And so this would just be saying, hey, we really like the program. We'd like you to continue funding it. Uh, I'm unclear where we are in that process. Peter, thoughts? Uh oh, he's not showing up on the screen anymore. Maybe we lost him. Oh, there he comes. Oh. Pete, I, I, you might still be muted. Well, we're, we're not hearing you. You don't appear to be can't, muted. I can't you, hear you, Peter. Can yeah. you unmute yourself? Hmm. Okay. Well, technical difficulties. No, we didn't. Not not hearing you, Pete. I don't know if you heard the question. I guess maybe he's going to sign off and come back in. Uh, Sally, from what I understand, certain things are at least for the next year, pretty much a done deal. Um, so, but I would say that comment uh, to elected officials is always good. Um, they, there's certainly always some sort of legislation or budgeting going on uh, that um, you know might have an effect. Uh, they claim to want to know. Uh, be able to tell a, a story so anything that can help them uh, tell a good story about stewardship and what it does i think is going to be helpful can you hear me now yes yeah i just had to reboot okay did you hear sally's question that for you it was a question regarding kind of where we are in the timeline of implementation yeah and uh, what my lips said but you couldn't hear me was that we we've kind of worked through the development stage and we're really in the implementation stage now. So um, there, there are some valuable comments, people, you know, so don't don't hold back. Uh, make sure folks understand what your uh, what your suggestions are. We've been told that this first year is going to be a kind of a pilot year. And after we get through one cycle, we'll have a chance to go back and kind of tweak uh, and make it better. So if you have suggestions, please share them. Uh, and if you don't see them implemented immediately, don't be surprised. Okay. Any other questions for Peter? See something in the chat? Uh, Jan is mentioning that there are some other uh, Grant opportunities. Uh, LSR stands for Landscape Scale Restoration. Uh, it is a competitive grant process uh, that's sort of next to stewardship, alongside of stewardship, uh, can be used to achieve some of the same results and outcomes. Uh, we did use that. We here in Maine uh, use that. Um, in the last year and were awarded a grant and that's what is going to fund the invasive plant program that I mentioned that we'll be hearing more about later. Um, 
Andy, I did have a slide on that, but uh, after talking to you, I kind of took it out because you were going to talk about it, but I'll just put out there that um, they did. Uh, they're changing the deadline for submission to bring it more in line with the national uh, program submission, and there have been some tweaks in the last farm bill kind of focusing its uh, uh, its application on the landscape away from urban more towards rural. Yeah. The, uh, the, the move towards um, that sort of competitive grant fund uh, methodology versus the stewardship grant, as you mentioned earlier, Peter, the, the flexibility um, that's afforded to stewardship, uh, you lose some of that with the, with the LSR grant because, of, of course, it's a grant that you have more specific deliverables. Doesn't mean it's not something that can be effective. Um, really, we're, we're going to be embarking on our first significant LSR grant with this invasive plant program. So that's something to stay tuned in to, and um, we'll be not only talking about it a little bit later today, but um, in subsequent stewardship uh, advisory committee meetings. And I, I mentioned that uh, the standing survey that'll be available on the website that we're gonna sort of tweak that, and we have to put it into a different format, and we'll make sure that there'll be some questions in there about the um, about that that method of funding uh, stewardship. So any other questions for Peter? We're pretty much using up uh, Jerry Barnes' time. Uh, Jerry, are you on yet? I don't see you. OK, if there's other questions for Pete, we could take them now. Otherwise, we'll we're just about at break anyway. Thanks, Andy. Uh, nice to see everybody. All right. Thank you, Pete, for participating. And uh, let's let's call the break. And uh, it's about 12 after, so hopefully everyone's back on the meeting. So, Jerry, I'll, I'll let you take it from here for a few minutes and, and give people the update on what's happening with NRCS and forestry. Okay, um, it, looking down through the list, I, and I recognize both of the names, but my name is Jerry Warrens. I'm the NRCS Forester for the state of Maine, and I'm currently on a detail for the national office working with the national TSP um, section in, in, in D.C. or out of D.C., although I'm working from home, so that's kind of nice. Um, I'll start with within Maine. Um, our organization, NRCS Maine, has had so many um, position changes, starting at the top, where Juan Hernandez had went to Florida, and we um, Dan Smith, which I'm sure a lot of you guys know from being in D.C. and Bangalore, is currently the acting state conservationist. And we're not real sure when that position will be filled. Um, and so I'll continue with the state office as far as updates within within the state office. I think that's probably the best place to start. We have a new um, cultural resource person named Nate King. Um, he's been on probably a year, um, but he's fairly new. He's he made it. He's from Arkansas and he's made it through one winter. So, and he's still here. So he may he may stay. Um, in our programs section at, at Maine, we have two new people right now: Leslie Nelson, who was a DC in Dover Foxcroft. And Brittany hum, Humboldt, who was the the DC in Belfast. Um, um, keep going down through. Ben Nyman was our fisheries biologist. He now is the 
um, assistant state conservationist for partnership and innovation. He's basically working on the big uh, Bay of Fundy aquatic connectivity project. It was just granted this year. It's it's a it's a big project. It's working through down east uh, Washington County. It's on the St. Croix. There's I believe there's almost 20 partners involved in that. Um, so which leaves a position the fisheries biologist that that um, Ben vacated is is a, will be filled at some point. Um, Brittany, who is working, Brittany Hill, is the acting operations for field officers. Um, her real jobs and programs, but because Dan Smith is acting, she's acting in his position. Um, I believe that is basically the changes that we have within the state office. Um, the field offices, there's, there's numerous changes as well. Um, the Bangor field office actually has remained basically the same as far as the state conservationist. We have one vacant vacancy for an engineer that's in the process of being filled. Uh, Dover Foxcroft um, and Leslie left there to work for programs in the state office. Seth Jones, who was in Prescott, is now the district conservationist in the Dover field office. Continuing down, our Hancock field office has remained the same within um, with in the Augusta field office, we have one vacancy um, soil conservationist that, that is currently in the process of being filled. We have a new soil con, con in Belfast. His name's Jorge, or I want to butcher his name, but it's Ortiz, Ortiz Montero, I believe. I didn't do a very good job at that. Um, the open office, um, Helena Swicek used to be the DC there. She's acting as still acting as a DC because it's vacant. She moved up to uh, Prescott, Isle, so she's the new Prescott Isle DC, still covering her old office. Um, the Farmington office is the same. Uh, the Lewiston office, Alex Stace, who was the conservationist in South Paris, has now moved to the Lewiston office. Fort Kent has lost two soil cons. One has been replaced with Alex Zetterman, um, and the other one is currently being Field. Machias office is, is the same. Prescott, like I mentioned before, they have a new D DC, Alina Swicek. They also have a new soil country. Con is Ethan Hill. Scal Egan has a new soil con, who's Alex Kloon. And um, since we last met their DC, who's been there quite a while now, is Nick Parisi, but he's new. Scrabble Field Office is pretty much the same, except for our partner biologist um, working on cottontail that's vacant and in the process of being filled. And let's see. So that's it for the update on personnel within our office. There, this, there will be updating the um, website, hopefully by noontime today. Um, it's scheduled to be updated 
although <laughs> next week uh, we there's there's other positions that should be filled and so that will need to be updated once again. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the Bay of Funded project was was uh, funded and um, it's it's about if I, if my numbers are. It, I think I got my numbers mixed up, but I'm not, it's a big project. And I'm not sure how much money we have being spent on that. Um, the TNC uh, Jerry, project, is, Jerry, yes. Jerry, just in the interest of, of time, because uh, we are running a little behind, can what what's the outlook on, you know, the forestry programs that you see in the, in the coming year? Um, okay. Um, that would be, be helpful, I was, thanks. I was getting to that as well. Um, for FY19, the overall equip budget was about 10.6 million. Within Maine, we, we wrote 126 plans, forestry cap plans that totaled roughly $280,000. And we had another $918,000 in implementation. So. It's been, since I've been here, we've roughly spent a million dollars a year, and I've been here since 2011. So um, uh, it it continues, to, we had a state allocation and then it went to a local pool, and we've continued to spend roughly a million dollars. It's, it's shifted from when it was a local, I mean, a state pool to a local pool, so, um, but it's still roughly about a million dollars. And it, it seems to be that we're going to continue um, this way, although there has been a bigger emphasis on the TSP program with the current administration. So hopefully we'll, we'll get that ironed out. And that's my current detail is we're working on, um, there's actually 10 teams stood up to review the TSP process from A to Z, from registration to training to uh, decertification to quality control, the whole nine yards. So in the interest of time, I will leave it there. Any questions? Okay, uh, just for the folks who don't know, TSP is a technical service provider, right? So those are uh, foresters that are, um, uh, qualified, authorized to write the CAP 106s and to do implementation, right? Correct. Um, in Maine, at most of our TSPs are foresters, but um, throughout the country, t technical service providers do everything from engineering to ag, implementing ag practices to forestry. So. Jerry, this is Mort Mossfield. Um, I just wanted to make sure I heard the numbers right. You said roughly 280K on on plans, and then how much on implementation? I wasn't sure where you were getting to a million dollars. It was 200 and, um, 280,000 on plans and 918,000 on, um, on implementation. Okay, yeah, that second number I didn't get right. Thank you. Okay. Nice to see you. Yeah. You as well. Yeah. So as as Dan mentioned earlier, um, a, a lot of what stewardship does is to help get people in the door over at NRCS, where where the funding is obviously significantly larger. <laughs> uh, but uh, that's great. Thank you, Jerry. Any other questions uh, for Jerry? And I um, just want to make sure, I'm not sure if I see when hands are risen, but if no hands risen, okay. All right, thanks, Jerry. Uh, Greg, are you set to go on the Be Woods Wise website? Yeah, I am. Thank you, Randy. Let me just, uh, so uh, can everyone see the, the web, web page here?
I'll say yes. OK, all right. Um, so yeah, what we're doing is we're working on updating uh, the Bee Woods Wise website. Um, it really hasn't been completely updated since its initial build back in uh, the early 2000s um, that we got funding for um, from the ice storm. So uh, what I'm showing you here is just a brief uh, overview of where at, we're at. It's uh, sort of in a draft uh, mode right now. So if you see anything, uh, you know, send along comments. Uh, we can pass them along now during the meeting or just uh, email Andy and he'll he'll get them to me. Uh, so this is the, you know, on the main forest service webpage, there'll be a, we have a woodlands owner, woodland owners page now, and, and we're sort of merging that with the uh, Bee Woods Wise. Uh, and, you know, there's going to be this sort of layout. Um, there'll be a slideshow of pictures here um, with each being, a, you can click on it to go to a different part of the web site. Um, in the top right hand corner, is sort of the kind of top things that people are uh, interested in um, that we found um, and of course we have you know our, you know visiting our district foresters you know starting them out getting information from us um, and then as well as some other you know kind of topics that are uh, most popular or uh, most pertinent at the time and those may change over time um, you know, I'll just go down the, the right hand side here. There's a place to sign up for our email bulletins, uh, the Woods Wise Wire, as well as the um, our other uh, weekly or monthly bulletins for the uh, insects, as well as uh, Project Canopy, um, a link to our YouTube uh, web channel. Uh, yes, we do have one. Uh, it's uh, It's growing, but not very quickly, but I think as we're doing uh, different um, remote events now, um, we're recording them and we'll be putting them up there. Um, and we also have a link to selected publications. Um, and we have sort of a welcome text in the in the center there, uh, just explaining what's buys. And then there is uh, sort of a, I'll say easier to read than just uh, a bunch of text. We have some images with links to different parts of the B Woods Wise website. Uh, there's also um, what we're trying to do is is um, I'll just click on one here is is to you know provide some sort of a little bit of text or, or a lot of text and then a link to other resources. Um, you know we don't want to just have uh, create <clears throat> content that's already out there. We'd like to direct people to uh, information that's already out there, either by us or by other um, sources. Um, we also have a, a link to uh, just added for the forestry for Maine birds um, on the Audubon website uh, to get people there. Come back here. Um, yeah, so there's um, trying to not to make it too busy, um, but, you know, get some, you know, these links here are sort of the kind of group different information together that um, landowners will, will find helpful. Uh, let's see. Um, one of the ones we've kind of taken from our, uh, the project we did or is currently doing is the Kenbeck Woodland Partnerships. And one of the parts of that website was this, uh, stewardship storyline um, so what we've done is we've uh, at this point we've just kind of recreated it under the new B woods wise um, and so we've recreated it here for people to to go through and uh, the storyline on each page has each sort of step along that that storyline along the right hand side of each page Let's see. I think that's really about an, uh, you know, without really getting into every single page, you know, that's just an overview. Um, okay. Yeah. yeah, I appreciate that. I think what we've re come to realize is we have a lot of really good information on our web page, but it was not necessarily in a real easy to find um, location. 
so we're trying to make it pulling together things like our woodland owners page, the the older B Woods Wise content, and um, somewhat more recent things like Kennebec Woodland Partnership. Also, you know, the linking to the partners such as uh, Maine Audubon for Forestry for Maine Birds. Uh, so we're going to continue to uh, work on that in the next few months and uh, try to get that uh, up live pretty soon. And then we'll obviously send something around about that. The Woodswise Wire, for those of you who are not on it, that's uh, one of the, the best ways to for us to get information out to you folks and for you to get it from us about new things, changes um, in the website, events, um, publications, so on and so forth. And uh, so, Sally, I hope you notice that wildlife is right up there at the top of the list. And um, <laughs> uh, also, Andrew Johnson was on the call. Andrew is the new landowner outreach biologist for the Inland Fish and Wildlife. Um, and actually, he came over from NRCS. He created that vacancy that Jerry mentioned down in, uh, in Scarborough. Um, but if anybody has thoughts about the website, um, please, uh, you know, feel free to let me know or, or um, you know, communicate to, uh, well, directly to Greg if you, if you feel like it. Uh, again, once we do a little bit more work, we'll actually get it up live and then um, it will be easier for you, everybody, to, to see it and use it. Are there any other questions or comments about that. Uh, just checking the chat. I think Teresa uh, has a hand raised. OK, whose oh, hand is? Oh, sorry about that. That was just to say I was here or something. I forget. <laughs> <laughs> but it looks great. It looks really good. I, I know we'll refer many um, people to the site because we, we get frequent questions um, about all the topics that you've listed there. So thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Teresa. OK, I think we're right about the point where Nancy Olmstead, if you're there. Are you ready Hi, to go? Yeah, I'm, I'm here. Um, may I go ahead and share my screen? Yes, please. Great. with me a minute here. Okay, so um, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks, Andy, for inviting me to share with you all about a new program. Uh, and really, it, it could be Andy or Jan um, giving this presentation because um, the program is a program of Maine Forest Service, but the Maine Natural Areas program is a, is a partner on the, pro on the program because this is a program about invasive plants. Um, so Andy, I should just confirm, can you see my slide? Uh, yes, yeah, we're seeing Great. the slide. Uh, I don't know if there's a way for you to turn up your audio a little bit. Yeah, it, it just involves me getting a little closer to the computer because uh, my computer is ancient and has one of these sad microphones. So is that better, Andy? <laughs> um, marginally. Okay. Uh, if you can get even closer, that might be better. All right, let me also, um, I will uh, just check to make sure that on my control panel, I have this shortcut now so that I can check it. Um, hardware and sound and sound. I'm just double checking that my microphone is turned up as far as it can go. Levels, yep, 100%. So that's as much as I can do for you, Andy. Um, I okay. will continue to be close to the microphone. Very good. And uh, we'll just listen really well. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, this program uh, is under the auspices of the WoodsWise program and the Project Canopy program. Uh, so WoodsWise Invasive Plant Assistance and Project Canopy Invasive Plant Assistance. And this is made possible through a grant to the Maine Forest Service from the U.S. Forest Service uh, through a program called the Landscape Scale Restoration Program. So 
We are excited to bring this program to Maine to help uh, landowners get resources to address invasive plant problems in their uh, woodlands um, and uh, town forests as well. So uh, let's see, I'm advancing my slide. Hopefully maybe I just click on this thing here. Yes, fantastic. So the program really has three components. Um, the first is an invasive plant academy and a corresponding landscape plan. Uh, and I'll tell you about each of these in more detail. Um, and then the second is cost share for invasive plant control practice plans, also known as invasive plant management plans. And the third part is competitive funding for full treatment. And so uh, I'll go into more detail, but this is a program that will kick off next spring, spring of 2021, and it will run through spring of 2023. And who knows, maybe we'll get uh, more funding to extend the program, but that's uh, the beginning of it anyway. Uh, so the Invasive Plant Academy, this is going to be a multi-day academy to prepare foresters and other natural resource professionals to create the invasive plant management plans or practice plans. And so, uh, as you can imagine, this is going to involve a lot of different components, but um, COVID-19 permitting, um, we will be indoors and outdoors at field sites, and uh, we will cover the identification and ecology of the important invasive plants of Maine forests, as well as invasive plants that are not yet detected in Maine, but are very damaging to forests. We will talk about survey strategy, mapping tools such as IMAP invasives and other tools, management methods for invasive plants, components of an invasive plant management plan, program reporting and requirements, uh, and testing. So there, this uh, academy is designed to credential people to be able to, to participate successfully in this program. And so we want um, folks uh, sort of gra graduating from the academy to have a certain competency so that they are ready to go out and assist landowners with this issue. Um, and there have been, there are several examples of other kinds of uh, invasive plant academies in nearby states and we'll be, uh, we've already reached out to a diverse um, set of instructors. So this will include um, herbicide professionals, foresters who are already offering invasive plant management as part of their businesses, as well as um, folks from the Board of Pesticide Control, uh, myself and other folks uh, skilled with invasive plant identification and ecology, um, and of course, uh, Andy and Jan, who will um, really be um, sort of the, the nuts and bolts of the program reporting and requirements. So um, I think this will be a lot of fun, uh, and I really hope that uh, we can do this in person um, or perhaps uh, do some combination of, of in-person and distance learning if uh, we're still needing to practice uh, physical distancing. All right. Um, sort of an accompaniment to the Invasive Plant Academy will be the Invasive Plant Landscape Plan. And this is basically going to be a manual for the program. And it will have the reference material uh, for the Invasive Plant Academy. So all the sort of um, you know, detailed documents about identification and management, um, soup to nuts, how to treatment guidance, plan examples, et cetera. So this will be more like the reference material, um, but this is obviously an important deliverable for the project. Um, and we've already started to uh, outline that and um, we're gonna be soliciting input from a variety of folks, as I, as I noted for the Academy. Uh, and then um, really excited to be able to offer cost share for invasive plant control practice plans. And so these plans will be prepared by the IPA graduates in the summers of 2021 and 2022. And um, yes, uh, the abbreviation IPA here stands for Invasive Plant Academy, in case you might be confused. Um, and so 50% of the landowner cost will be reimbursable up to a certain amount per acre or a maximum based on property size. We're still uh, working that out. And we'll have a standard format and components for plans prepared as part of this program. 
So I'm just showing here a, a visual, an example of the first page of a summary and management recommendations that uh, someone from our, our office, the Maine Natural Areas Program, prepared uh, for a state of Maine property, just to give you a sense of um, you know, the idea that there will be some standardized components here. And so we're hoping uh, to get you know, good participation um, from landowners uh, and um, towns uh, for town forests. And um, these will be available hopefully starting next summer. Uh, and this is an example of a map that would go along. Oops, sorry, folks. Uh, this is an example that just appeared here of a map um, that would go with the uh, written portion of the uh, practice plan uh, to illustrate, obviously, the locations and abundances of the invasive plants present. So a written component and also maps for the landowner. And then, oops, goodness gracious, very sensitive uh, touchpad here. I'm used to a mouse. Um, and then we're going to have competitive funding available for treatment. So the prepared plans uh, or properties can compete for funding. And so landowners, you know, will have the option to, uh, you know, take care of this themselves if they prefer, or if they'd like to go into um, uh, our, uh, applicant pool for funding, um, those projects will compete and awarded properties will have management paid in full by the grant. And so we're hoping to uh, have an, a sort of a staggered um, opportunity, one available in late summer, early fall 2021, and then another round that would be for treatments in 2022 um, to begin. And uh, as you know, there are a variety of effective methods for invasive plant management, um, both mechanical as well as herbicide um, and other methods such as uh, propane torch uh, and other uh, physical methods. So. Um, we will have a variety of, um, you know, sort of approved methods, and there will be uh, monitoring of treatment effectiveness by Maine Forest Service personnel. So district foresters um, will visit the sites to um, check up on them um, and see how things are going. So that's very exciting, and really the the bulk of the um, the award, the bulk of the financial award goes to uh, the treatment and the uh, cost share for the, the practice plans. So I think that's really the meat of what I wanted to cover. Um, my contact information is here, but I should have added Jan and Andy, but you, you all probably have all their contact information. If you have questions about the program, um, look for more information about the Invasive Plant Academy uh, coming this fall. And Andy, I'll stop there and ask if there's anything you or Jan want to add before we have questions. Um, I guess what I'll mention is that we envision the, um, the planning part to look very similar to Woodswise planning in terms of uh, you know the application and approval process and then the claim for uh, reimbursement you know for the financial incentive part um, so it, we're just going to kind of fold it into our current um, woodswise uh, planning structure if you will um, it'll it'll just be a different code um, uh, but uh, at least that's that's what we're planning right now so that um, for those folks who've been through the academy, many of whom I think will will be foresters, you know, from our stewardship list uh, and or TSBs, uh, they'll be um, the folks to prepare those plans, and they'll have, uh, you know, it'll be a very similar process to what we're doing now, as far as that goes. Uh, Jan, anything you wanted to add in there? Can't can't hear Jan. Can't hear you. I'm unmuted. So if you unmute, yeah, it's 
Jan is, is uh, ceding the microphone. She's given up. Um, sorry about that. Um, I think I heard her say in the beginning that she didn't have anything substantial to add. Jan, there's always the chat if there's anything in particular you want us to say, and she's giving me a thumbs up. Um, so I'll just turn my um, camera on for a second just to say hello. Um, and uh, Jason had asked if there are minimum woodlot size requirements for eligibility, uh, and I, I'm going to let uh, Andy answer that. I, I, I I'm, I think we had, yeah, I'll let Andy, Andy answer that one. I believe that we are still going to look at that 10 acre minimum, um, although it's not set in stone yet. Uh, I think we had talked a little bit about folks that could work together, um, you know, adjacent landowners that mm -hmm. uh, if, if we could come up with, um, you know, sufficient area. Uh, to a certain extent, this is this is like stewardship, but it's not exactly the same. So we may not be limited on the low end. <clears throat> Excuse me, uh, but that's a detail I could work out. Um, I should mention too that on the implementation side, there will be some ranking, uh, and those details will also have to be worked out. Yeah, in terms of the uh, the competitive treatment funding. Yep. We uh, would love to have enough treatment funding to be able to treat everyone in the state, but that's unrealistic. Um, I wanted to uh, respond to Dan Jacobs, who asked whether the program is a statewide program or is it targeted to specific areas. And um, uh, again, Andy, I'm going to ask for you to weigh in a little bit. We did have to target uh, certain um, U.S. Forest Service uh, mega regions. Um, uh, so we ha we had to target certain parts of the state, uh, but I think um, the the idea is to target family forests and municipal forests. And so, Andy, I'm hoping that maybe we have some flexibility to target those specific types of properties, even within the one FIA region that we did not include in the proposal. What do you think about that? Yeah, I, I, I believe we can, but uh, to be honest, at this point, I'd have to go back and look uh, to be absolutely certain. Um, yeah, the, so we uh, one, one thing about um, when you do competitive grant fund, uh, funds, you write the application, then you wait six months to find <laughs> out if you're going to get it. And then now that we've gotten it, we have to somewhat go back and make sure we're covering the, the mm -hmm. same level of detail as what we put into the grant application, but that I believe because it's not exactly the same as stewardship, that is not limited to that 50% that um, we'll be w doing with stewardship. Because we definitely recognize that the issue, while it's strongest in southern and, and coastal Maine, it's not absent from, you know, down east in and, <laughs> and Rosa County. So um, we, we want to make it available. And in fact, in some ways, those are the places where it's going to have the most effect if we can stop uh, or, or severe, you know, limit places where it's not widespread, where the plants are not looking like this picture here, <laughs> where they've basically taken over already. Um, right. Uh, and Sally, in response to your specific questions about um, the academy, we were aiming for, I believe, 30 folks each year, so for a total of 60. And um, in terms of the detail on the, and of course, you know, those folks um, hopefully will continue to offer this as part of their uh, businesses, um, part of their role in an ongoing way. Um, I think um, at the Natural Areas Program, we've had an NRCS uh, project, um, a similar kind of project, but funded through NRCS that uh, has targeted specific counties and we've seen a lot of demand. And so some landowners are, are even willing to pay for this cost out of pocket completely. So I, I'm hoping that there's a business opportunity here for foresters and other natural resource professionals to offer this as part of their business, um, even beyond the life of this one uh, grant funded project. 
Um, but we do hope that our project kind of kickstarts it and gets people the tools that they need and the knowledge that they need and the experience and, and you know, provides an incentive for landowners, um, uh, you know, for the, the period of the funding. Um, and in terms of how much specifically is available for the cost share and the competitive funding, um, it's the bulk of the of the three hundred and seventy thousand um, dollar award. So I want to say it's two hundred and seventy thousand or approximately that amount. Jan, you can correct me, um, but it's it's a it's not an insignificant amount. Um, so we're hoping that we can you know get a significant amount of uh, acreage and, and properties um, assessed and, and treated. I mean. You know your treatment dollars depending on what you need to do um, they don't go as far as you'd like but um, we're, we're hopeful that this will um, really sort of up the ante for people's thinking about uh, offering this as a service um, i also wanted to mention about the treatment dollars the a little bit different from if you think back on uh, the way the when Woodswise included implementation practice dollars, and it was done on the sort of traditional cost share where the landowner uh, worked with the contractor, and then we reimbursed a certain percentage. This is going to be handled differently. Uh, what people will be competing for there, I should say, the the plans will be handled like that. Implementation, though, uh, will be rolled up and contracted uh, through the main forest service. Um, and then those contractors will come and, and do the designated work on the private landowners. And that's simply because of the way the, the authorities in the, uh, that are behind the landscape scale restoration, uh, the legislation do not allow for quote cost share of implementation for practices, but it does allow um, the main forest service to actually hire contractors to go out and do work. Uh, so in the end, it should have the same result, uh, you know, getting good work done on the ground to limit, maybe not eradicate, but certainly help limit the spread of these plants and get them back in balance. But um, it's going to be uh, look a little different than traditional cost share. Andy, I have a question. And it's kind of a two part question. Have you have you thought of um, how this if you get a plan written, do they have to go through your funding, or, or could they come into an NRCS office and use that plan for funding? And uh, vice versa, if they have some uh, cap written that has invasive um, recommendations in it, would you allow them to go in and dive in, um, indulge into your, the, um, not cost share, but the financial assistance that you mentioned? Or is that yeah, something that we, you, you and I need to talk about? <laughs> yeah, good good thing to talk about. Um, I'm I'm sure we can work something out uh, along those lines. Uh, I think what as we develop the um, the manual, so to speak, and and the uh, the landscape plan, they're going to be the the must haves in the planning process. And I think if somebody gets a plan that has those must have items, uh, we could still potentially uh, accept them um, into the, at least they could apply for um, the uh, the implementation dollars. And at the same time, if what we have in our plan uh, works for NRCS, um, then that uh, it can mm -hmm. work both ways. But yeah, well, we should talk a little All bit right. about that as we develop the actual plan criteria. Okay, any other questions okay. for Nancy? Yes, I have a question. Uh, this is Merle Ray. Hi, Merle. Uh, I, uh, in order to write the plan, this uh, resource professional, they don't have to be a licensed applicator, I'm assuming. Correct. So they would hire a contractor who was a licensed applicator. Uh, so the the uh, main forest service, if the project was uh, selected for the funding, would hire a treatment contractor. And if the plan called for uh, herbicide application, then yes, you know, th then we would be the forest service would be hiring a licensed applicator. All right, does thank that you. Answer your question. Yeah. Okay. Yes, it does. Okay. 
Any other questions uh, for Nancy? Questions about uh, the program? It's really in its very beginning stages, so uh, there is still room to make adjustments. And uh, I know some of you folks have a lot of experience uh, dealing with this, so your suggestions are definitely welcome. Yep, thanks Andy uh, for the chance to present about the program and um, uh, excited to uh, work with everyone on publicizing when the time comes. All right. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, are you still sharing your screen? I I don't think I am. Uh, we'll yeah. No, I yeah. think I think no one is sharing the screen. You can still see it. Well, I can figure that out here. Let's see. Uh, Back where you shared it, Nancy, there should be an X on that. That yeah, center. there isn't, so that's weird. Um, maybe if I just turn my camera off, maybe I have to do that. No, that just now we don't see no. you. Well, saying. you know what? I'm going to leave the meeting, and so then it'll probably go away. <laughs> All right. Well, I hope so. I mean, not that not looking for you to leave the meeting, but uh. right. I understand. <laughs> Um, so let me try. I'll share again and then I will. Um, okay, there you go. Okay, and now I can maybe stop sharing. Okay, so let's see if I can stop sharing. There we go. Okay. All right, well, thank you. Uh, so my pleasure. I'll put myself on the screen here for a moment. Okay, so now we're at the part of the meeting where. Um, and we've done this the last several times we've held these meetings. Uh, basically, it's an opportunity for everybody on the call to um, give us a little thumbnail sketch of what you or your organization's doing. Um, of course, we'd, we'd like to hear what you're doing uh, that's, that's in partnership with the Maine Forest Service, but not just limited to that. What you might be doing um, to help promote stewardship and, and management for um, you know, woodland owners, what we call family woodland owners, those 10 to 1,000 acres, or slightly smaller or slightly larger. Um, we're not going to ask for the, you know, all the numbers right here. Uh, there's about roughly 10 folks on the call that I see that what we might call um, real people, not, not just uh, main forest service. Um, so maybe we'll give a little priority to to those folks uh, to 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 uh, report in, is there anybody that would like to start? I Go think ahead, I Don. Qualify. You, yeah, you are Don. a real person, Don. <laughs> All right. Uh, the uh, we were talking. I made a couple of notes as we went along. The uh, reasons for owning land. I I consider myself uh, positioned quite well to have dealt with that for the last 47 years of being a realtor. And I I, I think that uh, we could have a chat, not now, but if anybody wants to talk about that a bit more, I'd, I'd just soon join a subcommittee on trying to uh, uh, determine what those reasons typically are. The uh, delivery of information, uh, I was we're faced with it in our professional business. How do we reach people? And the that is changing rapidly. And COVID-19 has had, had something to do with that. So that uh, th there's a uh, two-edged sword there in that you can reach people, but if you come through certain uh, media, uh, people don't trust you. So it's it's important to determine where people get their information and where do they get the information that they they trust. Um, and a, a thought about getting information out about forest practices that uh, folks might take home with them. The uh, there's a lot of uh, trail uh, mileage in the state of Maine that travels through forests and uh, to me, there are opportunities to post information along with forest projects to explain to people uh, what's going on and why. I, I tried that in my own woodlot when we did the field day, 
and I've had a, a lot of positive comments, not only from the field day, but from the many people that walk and ski and bike my trails. So I, I think that's just a, a nice way to communicate with folks that are out there in the woods uh, enjoying uh, that aspect of life in Maine. Um, I think that was it. Thank you very much. Thank, thanks, Don. Um, you, you could have uh, tooted your own horn just a little bit more, so I'll do it for you. Uh, you're the 2019 uh, Outstanding Tree Farmer of the Year, and you are uh, in the running for, well, I guess now it'll be the 2021 National Outstanding Tree Farmer, um, which uh, that particular event got postponed like a lot of things, uh, but you're, you're among eight uh, tree farmers in the entire country to be in the running for that. So I just thought folks ought to know that. Well, I didn't want to blow my own horn, you know. <laughs> That's okay. We'll do it for you. Uh, okay. Anybody uh, want to go next? I'm I'm thinking, and that was a nice, uh, a good, concise thing, Don. Um, the idea of trail science, by the way, is something that back in the day we were starting to put some stewardship dollars into that. Uh, there's a couple examples of that. One up in Smyrna, um, I think uh, spring break, right, Dan? Is that uh, that Smyrna? Um, there's uh, interpretive science there about forest practices. And another location where we did that was at the Hidden Valley Nature Center down in uh, in uh, Alna or Jefferson. And it's a great idea. It was one of those things we would have done more of, but that's about when that funding curve dropped off. Uh, if we were able to get back back into a position to do more of that, I think that would be great if, if we can at least encourage it or help people technically assist people in, in the developing those signs. Um, uh, I'm sure I'm sure we will or we would. Um, anybody else? Uh, should I call on people or does I see the chat? Uh, ah, Joe, go ahead. Well, I think it's timely uh, to weigh in here is uh, at our demonstration for us, the Yankee Woodlot in Skowhegan. Uh, we've actually been devising signage like Don mentioned and you mentioned, Andy, and we'll be putting it together over the winter and installing it next um, spring. It's We've noticed there's a lot more traffic on our trails, uh, which is nice with the pandemic, and we see the opportunity to just educate more people like you both mentioned uh, on that aspect. Um, also at the Yankee Woodlot, uh, we have now are entering our second year of our picture post uh, monitoring program, looking at long-term monitoring at the dis different forestry practices that we implemented several years ago with harvests, and that's going well. People now are interested because of the number of uh, photos that are there. You can start seeing changes already after two growing seasons. So that's been a, a positive aspect of our uh, educational programs there. And one last item to plug would be, uh, we're one of the counties that's working with Nancy on the uh, invasive uh, plant surveys. This is our second field season of doing that in Somerset County. Uh, huge interest by landowners. People are very interested in understanding more about treatments and how to manage. And uh, you know they really are receiving the management plans we write and all the mapping that we provide. Uh, in a constructive way and they you know many of them want to implement you know treatment options or just better understand how they can minimize spread so really the two areas we've been working a lot on here this year in somerset county and that's all from here okay great um i maybe something that occurs to me that you might want to touch on i think uh you you've got a, a blog going about the Yankee Woodlot that people can sign up for? Yeah, we're, you know, it's it's kind of how you, you do Woodwise, Andy, is we've had people that come to our programs when we had programs in person and always want to learn more. So Jennifer Brockway and I uh, here at the office have been just putting together little tidbits of information from if you're redoing a ATV bridge, just pictures and descriptions, 
uh, talking about forest health, uh, forest pests and disease, just little things that we can then send them to other links to. And there seems to be a, a growing number of individuals that have signed up and then that forces us, of course, to make sure we have timely submissions on that blog. Okay, great. I just, uh, again, there's getting back to what Don said, places to get information and good information, information that you trust and uh, soil and water conservation districts are another one of those places. So thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, anybody else? Who's next? I'll make a comment about demonstration forest. Go for it, Merrill. Now, as you know, I've been working on a demonstration forest in Brownfield for the uh, Soil and Water Conservation District for years. And what we've noticed this summer is there's a real uptake in, uptick in, in usage uh, because people feel safe out, out in the woods walking where they don't feel safe in other places. But other hiking trails, I've noticed that it, it's almost to the point where you feel unsafe because there's so many people using the trails now. You know, the parking lots are just filled up and, and you know, you're getting into the area of having too many people using the trail. So uh, it's too much of a good thing in some, some cases. Uh, I've also been asked to create a new demonstration forest for one of the land trusts over here in Western Maine. So that'll, that'll be good. And, and that'll be a new option for people to use. Uh, I'll also comment on, on the fact that COVID-19 has had a real impact as far as meeting people. Uh, I typically go out and do walk and talks with folks and especially on tree growth. And some out of staters especially have been unable to come to their woodlots this year because of COVID-19. And that's a, that's a downside. And people feel anxious about me coming out to their woodlots to meet with them for safety's sake, obviously. But on the other side, when I do get out there, I've noticed that a lot of people, because they feel so isolated these days, are really anxious to talk with somebody as long as it's done safely. Uh, so there's downsides and upsides to this, 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 this COVID business of people really are glad to have someone come to their to the land as long as they feel safe because they need someone to talk to these days <laughs> yeah yeah it's um I, it's it's actually a great in general to be involved with woodland stewardship and and giving people information about the woods uh i think the advantage is there's usually enough room in the woods to be safe um different people have different levels of risk or, or feel different levels of risk. Uh, our district foresters um, are dealing with that. And um, of course, another issue is the, you know, when the out of state landowner comes up uh, dealing with the quarantine and testing um, protocols there. But uh, at least, at least in the woods, um, yeah, you're outside. There's, there's the room to maintain distance. And uh, I think we, we have an advantage in doing outreach in that setting. Uh, looks like uh, Andrew Johnson, you want to go up next? Sure. Hi, everyone. If you don't know me, I'm Andrew Johnson. I'm the new uh, private lands biologist at Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. Um, this is a brand new position based in the uh, beginning with habitat program and it's the first step or a step in inland fisheries and wildlife's goal towards more private landowner engagement and helping private landowners with habitat management. And so one part of our, our mission kind of in the near future is revamping our beginning with habitat website to have a landowner portal. Um, you know, a portion that really connects landowners to the resources to manage their land and wildlife and habitat guidance and connects them with the beginning with habitat maps. If you haven't seen these, it shows, you know, what natural resources, natural resources we know about on the land across the state, 
where our rare and threatened and endangered species are that could use some, you know, habitat assistance, um, where our rare natural communities are. And so if people know what they have or what's in their area, it can empower them to, you know, include it in their management. And we hope to connect them with the resources to do that. Um, so that website will kind of be this clearinghouse and guide to, you know, connecting people to their district foresters, connecting people to forestry for Maine birds, these great resources that are out there, um, connecting them with those along with other um, items available and guidance for habitat management. So that's the website, you know, broad scale. In the long term, we hope to also better identify um, exactly what we want to see on the ground. We've got this state wildlife action plan with hundreds of priorities, um, many of which involve private lands management, but figuring out exactly what we're asking for and where it's relevant really needs to be uh, better defined. And so working on that and figuring out the real high priorities that we can put into action on the ground. Um, and once we've kind of fleshed that out, help maybe train district foresters so they know what's relevant in their area and can identify when there's opportunities to, you know, really help habitat and priority species when the landowner's interested. And then maybe also translating those inland fisheries and wildlife, wildlife goals into um, practices or specifications for some of the NRCS practices. There's for stand improvement, um, thinning for wildlife is one NRCS practice. And I think with the right criteria that could be used to help very specific species in specific locations. And this is all kind of hopes and dreams of this program is being able to connect inland fisheries and wildlife goals to existing resources out there so that we're all kind of coordinating. Um, so it's an evolving process and we're in the very early stages, but that's the path that we're on. Okay. And eventually, uh, eventually there might be also boots on the ground from inland and fisheries helping provide that technical guidance as well. Um, but in the, as long as it's only myself, one person in this position, um, it's probably going to be more empowering the people that are already out there. All right, great. Thank, thank you, Andrew. And it's uh, good that you're getting your your name and face out there. So first of all, people know the position exists and that you're in it. Um, I think that and you and I have talked about this, you know, the regional biologists in some places are already in the habit of, of um, talking to woodland owners. We do know that uh, woodland owners uh, across the country and, and Maine very similar will list wildlife high up on their priorities uh, for their, why they own the land and, and what's important to them. So uh, it, it's just a natural connection with forest management. Um, although some people think of these things as mutually exclusive, they really aren't. And I think uh, the, the future here is for, you know, the, the two agencies to work more closely together and, and use tools like forestry for Maine birds um and and you know main audubon initiatives of various kinds to uh sort of bring people into that stewardship storyline uh where they may be doing things to help wildlife but at the same time it's it's managing forests and it's creating a flow of wood products um you know there's that side of things too so uh looking forward to doing more and uh, having you at future stewardship advisory committee meetings and you may be having uh, your analogous uh, advisory committees. You may already see names on this list that you um, would like to invite to, to that. So that, yeah, so that could be a natural segue either towards maybe Sally Stockwell or uh, Mike St. Peter. Want to say something about what's happening with logging, Mike, or anybody else uh, ready to have your four and a half minutes of fame. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, Sandy, uh, thanks for the opportunity to, you know, to uh, give you my perspective. You know, from logger training and education, we 
we still are plotting along. Um, we have uh, just about 1,100 active loggers uh, in the program currently. Uh, we're always looking for new subject areas to, you know, to uh, uh, give to the loggers. I think uh, many of those individuals um, that work either for large large contractors or, or sole proprietorships that, um, you know, sometimes uh, have a lot of interaction with woodland owners. And, and I, I think any, anything that we can provide to the logging community to help them interact with, with uh, landowners is, uh, is quite important. Um, I think that uh, uh, we've, We've done well. We have a good history of coordinating with the Maine Forest Service to, you know, provide pertinent information to the loggers. Uh, our recertification process uh, this year, uh, we're covering um, some BMP issues and also what would my woods look like, as you're well familiar, Andy, uh, in supporting us with that. And, um, you know, we'd be we'd be open to I think uh, I think the invasive plant and insects are. Uh, we've done insects in the past with the entomology department for the Maine Forest Service, but um, a, a little um, a little commercial on in, invasive plants just to let the loggers know that you know what's out there and what they should be looking for and how that may be reported. Um, you know that that may be interesting. Um, not. Not all the loggers work with foresters, uh, unfortunately, but then again, I think that some of those loggers that don't, you know, try to do the right thing and, you know, anything that we can do uh, as a program, uh, we're more than willing to, um, you know, we're more than just health and safety where, you know, we look at uh, the loggers uh, from a global perspective and, and we want to make sure that they have all the all the information they need to make responsible decisions. Uh, uh, going back to the safety part of it, uh, I think we're seeing more landowners uh, manage their own properties, uh, whether they're gentle uh, gentlemen or gentlewoman uh, 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 harvesters. Uh, I, I think that uh, you know, good directional felling practices, you know, should be right up front, whether it's, you know, with conventional logging or, or mechanical logging. I think there's, there's, there's quite a bit of information there that we'd be willing to share with the landowner community. Uh, anytime any one of you know of a group that, you know, would like some of that instruction, we can provide that. Uh, but certainly uh, we're here to to help wherever we can. So I think that's about it, Andy. Any questions? Okay. Thanks, Mike. Any questions from Mike? I, I will say that in, with your uh, recertification classes in the past, I know you've, uh, you've uh, brought forestry for Maine birds to loggers. Um, uh, and you mentioned the what will my woods look like? That's a that's a, uh, a relatively new booklet that the Maine Forest Service has out with a before and after harvest pictures to help people literally envision what's going to happen uh, after different types of uh, harvesting and other silvicultural operations. And that's something we do want to expand on. Um, and uh, that ties me back to what Joe's doing uh, with the Yankee Woodlot and those picture posts. Uh, that is recording the story of the woods, literally, um, through time, and particularly when there's a harvest, uh, to see the before, the after, and then a year after that, and a few years after that. And it, it becomes a powerful tool for letting people know what a lot of us know, because we live it, but um, how the forest changes, both with, uh, in between um, the, you know, harvest or the, uh, the sort of the drastic moment of management and then the the more subtle changes that that occurs every year so again thanks mike uh anybody want to go next sure this is sally i'll go next okay 
Hi, everybody. So um, I'm with May. For those of you who don't know me, I'm with Maine Audubon, Director of Conservation, and have been um, <clears throat> very involved with our Forestry for Maine Birds program. Many of you have partnered with us on that program, and I'm certainly grateful for you for that. So this is really a partnership between Maine Audubon, the Maine Forest Service, Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, the Forest Steward Guild, but we also have partnered with the Soil and Water Conservation Districts with the New England Forestry Foundation, with different land trusts. And um, so like everybody else, you know, we've been adapting to our COVID situation. And so we have, uh, we had a whole slew of workshops scheduled for this spring and, um, and, and summer, but most of those got either delayed for a year or, or canceled, but we were able to do one workshop over in Lovell. We're doing one in the Down East Lakes region in August. We, Andy and Amanda Mahaffey from the Forest Stewards Guild work with me to do a couple of webinars. And we put together a series of mini videos that are trying to sort of recapture the essence of what we teach in those workshops that it just went live last week. Um, all of that, we're updating, like the Maine Forest Service, we're updating our Forestry for Maine Birds webpage so that it includes these new resources. We've reprinted all of our guides the for, with help from the Maine Forest Service and grant from the Maine Outdoor Heritage Fund and the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. So we've reprinted our forester's guide, our landowner guide, and our logger's guides. Um, and then two other things that you may not know about, are we, we are... We, we also put together a series of demonstration signs, demonstration forest signs that highlight each of the different kind of habitat features that we're trying to promote through the Forestry for Maine Birds program. And I would love to share that series. There's eight, a series of eight signs. I'd love to share that with all of you on the call who've expressed interest in doing some signage at demonstration forest. There may be an opportunity for you to take these. What we've done is we've created a template and then each property, each landowner can modify the contents of the template to be specific for that particular property and site. And um, so we can make those available and we'll work with people on making edits. We're working with the Kennebec Estuary Land Trust right now on making some edits to uh, uh, just three of the eight signs that they are interested in putting out at the Sewell Woods property in West Bath. So we're happy to do that with others. And then we're also doing a little bit like the um, photo posts. We're doing some remote recording of birds that are present before a harvest and after a harvest and trying to document what kind of changes we're seeing over time. And we're testing the efficacy of using these remote recording units versus just sending people out to do in-person um, surveys. So look look for some more information on that later on. And we will we're just really excited to continue to work with everybody on this program. So thanks. OK, thanks, Sally. Um, did you want to say anything about your Lower Kennebec uh, initiative? Um, yeah, so there's two areas of the state that we're, we're we work statewide, but there are two areas of the state that we are kind of focused on in more detail. One is in Western Maine, where we're current, we've enlisted, um, uh, well, we've worked through the Natural Resource Conservation Service as well to enroll uh, about 26 landowners in doing management plans that feature, that are what basically what we're calling sort of wildlife friendly management plans that focus not just on birds, but the other wildlife, fish and wildlife that, um, could benefit from these management plans. And now we're working with the New England Forestry Foundation to sort of pass those people on to them plus other people so that New England Forestry Foundation can work with them on actually putting together a habitat restoration plan and implementation plan. And um, somebody, I forget who it was now, mentioned, the, maybe it was you, Andrew, that mentioned looking, trying to look at ways to cross check the NRCS practices with wildlife habitat goals. We've done that for a lot of the particular goals of the Forestry for Maine Birds program already, so I'd love to follow up with you on that. 
and certainly can make that available for others as well. Um, and then in the Kennebec, the Lower Kennebec project, we also have some funding to work directly with landowners on developing these wildlife friendly management plans and we're working closely with the district foresters to get out there. We have um, we have close to 50 people who've expressed interest in learning more, doing a walk and talk with the district foresters. Some of those people are interested in going on to put together a management plan, others are not, but we are providing, uh, Maine Audubon is providing some upfront financial incentives for people who agree to enter into a contract with a forester to develop a wildlife friendly management plan. So if any of you are foresters that work in that area or are in, or know others who are interested in working in that area, we'd, be, we'd love to share that information with you if you don't have it already. Anything you want to add to that, Andy? No, I think that's great. Um, I'll, I will, if nobody else does, I'll probably mention another similar uh, project that we're doing in Eastern Maine, but not at the moment. Uh, the question I had about the signs, will those templates um, be something that you'll post on your website so that anybody can see them? Or is that more of a individual one-on-one -on -one, you talk to you type of thing? Uh, I don't know what would be most helpful. We could certainly, we certainly can post them and then say if you're interested in having one of these um, developed for for your property, get in touch with us. I, I'm not, I'm not sure. I mean, we have we have funding to do a series of maybe three to four signs at something like four or five different demonstration forests where we've only committed to doing these this first series at the Sewell Woods as a test. Okay, so we're kind of open to where else they might go. Um, so if you're interested, let me know. But if if folks would find it helpful to post them on the web page and have some wording that says, if you're interested in using these, please get in touch with us, we can do that. Or we can also just, I guess, make them available for people to do their own edits. Um, but we want to make sure that the edits are consistent with the message we're trying to get across, so. Sure. Uh, yeah, maybe maybe just as an example, if they were up there with that, you know, if you, if you like this idea and you want to do it in your woods uh, or in your trails, you know, here's the number to call and, um, you know, the, whatever works for you guys. But I, I'm just thinking yeah. that might get the word out a little, yeah. little further. Um, <clears throat> and then let's say there was once it's up on the website and there was a little blurb about it, it's something we could put out in the Woods Wise Wire. OK, that'd be, that'd be great. OK, Thank I have you. a question. What, what right. material what material do you use to make those signs from? Um, I forget we we talked to a couple of different sign makers and that we have somebody on staff who's our graphic designer and she did the homework on that. But I could certainly send you that information what she the information she gave me. Okay. I, I can curious. send it on to I can send it on to Andy and then he can he can forward it to anybody who's interested. Yep, that sounds good. I, I work with a couple of demonstration for us and that might be something we'd be interested in. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I, I know I know you've got some pretty uh, impressive signs there in Brownfield, uh, more like kiosks really that that are uh, uh, quite you know sturdy and they're and long lasting. Some of the signs that we'd uh, helped with in the past were on were, were metal, um, uh, kind of a sheet metal, um, with with um, trying to remember now how the how the lettering was put on there. Dan might recall because I think he was part of that process up there in Smyrna. But uh, there's different ways to do it um, so that it's um, uh, like I said, long lasting and uh, and you know helpful. Anyway, yeah, well, uh, what we found uh, most useful for us as far as being long term is it's it, it's a, an aluminum plate that's, that the, the image is embossed right on. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it's it's an easy thing to do if, if you go to a sign maker, they can do that. You can just send them a file of, of uh, what what it is that you want to have put on there and they just emboss it right on there. And it's fairly relatively inexpensive to do. Yeah, I think I, that sounds like what we had done uh, again back in the day. It's, it's been a while since I've been directly involved, but uh, 
more people out in the woods, more chance for them to see signs. Yep. The one thing I always say about a sign, though, is that they're great um, as long as they're maintained. And if signs that sort of deteriorate uh, almost work the opposite, they, they sort of detract from the experience. So uh, that's just always my word of caution about putting signs up is make sure they're places and you've got folks who can keep an eye on them and if something happens to them, graffiti or whatever, <laughs> defacing of the sign uh, to, to either take the sign down or correct it. But, um, but they seem yeah, to that's, work. That, that's true of, of all of the demonstration for us. It's easy to create. It's the maintaining it is the hard part. And that's the right. most important part, because as you say, once it starts to deteriorate, then it's counterproductive and people won't go. Yeah. OK, who wants to go next? I'm willing to go next, Andy. It's Molly. Go ahead. Okay. Um, Molly, yeah. I think my video is coming on. Yeah, there we go. There you go. Um, so I, I was going to talk a little bit about the invasives work of which much of it has already been covered and then kind of our other function, which is at risk species and habitats and long term conservation. So as Nancy noted, um, and the partnership with Maine Forest Service and US, with funds from US Forest Service is a big push to get boots on the ground. And I can remember it was about five years ago sitting down with Teresa Kirshner and Mort Mosswild, and they're saying you can map as much as you want out there, but it's ultimately getting boots on the ground and control of invasives. And I think we're finally there. So I'm really excited about this project launching with regard to kind of training of trainers and just getting a lot more knowledge out to people. Um, Nancy's been busy with a lot of outreach. I think actually the loggers are one of the, the um, programs that's going to be coming up, which will be working directly with them. But just for anyone who wants to schedule a training, whether it's virtual or not, one of the benefits is with regard to invasive species is if you go through the training, then we get you get a free guide. Um, so we're getting those out as much as possible right now. We've got some funds to make sure that we can get those out at free folks who've gone through training. Um, and then Joe, Joe had mentioned the work um, that we've gotten with funds from Natural Resource Conservation Service to work with um, farmers, many of which it's woodlots. Um, at Somerset County was one of the counties, but we've also got Kennebec, Knox, Lincoln, and Waldo County, um, just in terms of um, doing free mapping. And then there are funds for some control on, on those lands as well. But it's working through the soil and water conservation districts there as boots on the ground. Um, with regard to at-risk species and habitats, the Natural Areas Program continues to, with Lisa St. Hilaire, many of you may know her through direct contact, um, reviewing forest management plans, and we're doing between six and 700 a year, um, and coordinating those reviews with Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife Species Biologists and um, Regional Biologists. And then we're also doing the same thing with Farm Bill projects that come to us via that re respective NRCS offices, primarily equip projects to kind of look at the impacts for those projects. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that in the upcoming year, having heard Andrew Johnson speak about beginning with Habitat, trying to broaden their function and, and website to address private landowners, the fact that the data checker is down, for those of you who might have known the online data checker, and then the new kind of online fawn process that's going to be coming live that maybe Maine Forest Service, Inland Fisheries and Wildlife and Natural Areas Program can get together to create some efficiencies there because I think there are a lot of efficiencies that could be had, not just with forest notification plans and forest management plans, but also proactively working on, on certain at-risk species and habitats. So I hope that happens and I'm looking forward to potentially doing that. And then lastly, for those of you who might not know, we have four ecologists in the program. Um, as of actually the first of this month, one of our ecologists is going to be dedicated solely to public lands. Justin Schlawin is going to be moving into that position, which makes our vacancy that much more important to fill. So Andy Cutco, who left the program um, close to three years ago, we're going to be filling his position looking for a forest ecologist, um, which will be really relevant with regard to forest stewardship. Um, and we're hoping to maybe get a licensed forester. That's my dream um, in, in terms of just making sure that we can maintain our capacity at addressing um, stewardship on the ground. So um, that's just a quick update for the Natural Areas Program. All right, thank you. And I'll, I'll see if I can do a commercial here. 
for that guidebook, although it seems to be disappearing. I don't know. Oh, wow. Well. <laughs> That's not working. Oh, there, it there it is, yeah. I think. Okay. That's the guidebook that you're referring to that, um, you know, if folks look for a consultation with you, they can get one of these. Whoops. Oh, well. <clears throat> Still learning the virtual world here. Um, or they can purchase that, right? That's available for, for purchase. Yep. Details on the website, the Maine Natural Areas Program. Okay. Well, um, one, one other thing I was just going to mention, it's kind of a, the bigger picture. I, I, I sat on the Natural and Working Lands um, Climate Committee of the Governor's Task Force or Council, and one of the recommendations coming out addressed private stewardship. And, um, and I would just encourage folks to continue to maybe follow the process to make sure that that one goal doesn't leave. Um, the specific recommendation was actually increasing um, stewardship foresters at Maine Forest Service by 10. Um, and so hopefully that that with support that will continue to, to persist, just to let folks know. Okay, great, thank you. Any questions or comments for Molly? Um, Teresa, I wanted to make sure you got a chance to say hi. <laughs> You're still there? Yeah. Uh oh. All right, we're not hearing you. How's that? There you go. Okay. I was just getting ready to sign off, but I'll I'll, I'll try and go real quickly. Thanks for fitting me in. Um, okay. For those for those of you I don't know, um, this is Teresa Kirchner. I'm the executive director at the Kennebec Land Trust in Winthrop and we serve 21 communities around the capital region. We've been partnering with the Maine Forest Service since 2009, first with the Kenbeck Woodland Partnership and then since 2013 with the Local Woodworks Initiative. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the Local Woodworks Initiative, it's a statewide partnership and our partners are Maine Forest Service, the Nature Conservancy, Maine Coast Heritage Trust, CEI, Grow Smart Maine, and the Northern Forest Center. And our goals with the Local Woodworks Partnership are to support the long-term conservation and sustainability of Maine's forests, similar to all of you, and to also support um, forest-based businesses in Maine. And our main audience for that initiative has been architects and builders for the last four years. So we've taken architects and builders out on tours of main forest-based businesses and managed forest lands and tried to connect them to the products that we hope that they will source for their um, projects and to educate their clients about the benefits of sourcing main woods. Wood. Um, we have a main wood um, buyer's guide on our website, on our local woodworks website. Lee Burnett is our contractor and he can answer questions about that. We are in the same place that many of you are with being a little bit stalled with COVID, but we just met yesterday to figure out how we're gonna adjust our plans for a tour, hopefully for this spring. And Morton and Andy, you've also been involved. So if I've missed anything since I have to jump off soon. Oh, I should say that the whole project since 2013 has been funded by the Elmina B. Soul Foundation. We're very grateful for their support. Um, and for any of you who are on this call um, for your participation as well. So Andy or Morton, did I leave anything out that you think is a highlight? Um, that covered probably. it for me. <laughs> Go ahead, Mort. Oh, I was just going to say that pretty much covered it. I think uh, at one point early on, just for Peter's reference, um, we had some U.S. Forest Service funding as well. So um, that was quite a ways back, but uh, it was very helpful at the time. Yes, that was what we termed the Kennebec Woodland Partnership. And I believe that the, the little booklet from that is still being used by, by Kennebec Land Trust, right? You're still... It, it goes is, out. We still pass those out on a regular basis. Okay. As do as do we. Yep. And and we still have plenty, by the way, if you run out. Great. Thank you. <laughs>
And the other thing I'll just say about that is a lot of what we developed for the Kennebec Woodland Partnership uh, web pages are will will continue to live in the new B Woodswise web pages, things like the stewardship storyline and the uh, the tool shed um, and the uh, there was a glossary of terms there. So a lot of that work is uh, was, was certainly done uh, with the uh, US Forest Service um, funding and uh, it's going to continue to be be useful in, in the as stewardship goes forward. And uh, Andy, thank you, Teresa. Yeah, Andy, I'll just mention quickly because I do have to run that if anybody has any additional questions about local woodworks, we would very much appreciate any comments or feedback. You can get a lot of information on our website, either the land trust or just type in local woodworks. We are at a point now where we have, I think, about $150,000 worth of funding left from the Soul Foundation, but we have been trying for the last three years to develop a long-term plan and a, a permanent structure for local woodworks in the state. Um, and we've explored options for making it a, a regional, a more New England-based initiative. But if anyone is interested in talking to Lee or to me about um, our goals, I, I would certainly appreciate um, your perspectives. Okay, great. You want to put that in the chat? Put your uh, um, website. Sure. That's pretty simple. Uh, KLT.org, right? W. Yep. Yeah. The TKLT.org. TK. All right. Yeah. Um, I think that. All the real people have had a chance to talk. <laughs> so are there any unreal people who would like to say something? And by that, I just mean, you know, Morton, you want to say anything about, uh, you know, how the field team is is going? Oh, and Jason Lilly, sorry. I, I meant to check in with you. So why don't, Jason, if you want to say what's happening with extension down your way. Like a non-real person status, Andy. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, uh, I'm Jason Lilly. I work for Humane Cooperative Extension based out of Cumberland County. And uh, one of my roles there is uh, uh, as a member of the Beginning Farmer Resource Network, which is um, how I stay up to speed with a lot of the forestry stuff that's happening, where Andy's also a member of that. Um, and uh, with that being part of my job, we get about 25 to 30 prospective or beginning farmers that come through just my office. Um, and there's a few hundred that come through the other county offices um, across the state. And, um, you know, are looking to buy land or already have land and are looking for better um, information and resources about how they can best utilize that. So. Um, it's a really great opportunity to be on the call today and to learn more about um, what all of you do and to learn, uh, you know, your names and get to know you um, so that we can um, refer folks to the work that you're doing um, when they're looking for information about how to best manage their land. Um, another aspect of my work is to run the farm and tractor safety program throughout the state. Um, that, that program is geared towards youth, but every year we get quite a few adults who are in the program, um, and a lot of them are there learning to how or learning to use, you know, the the winch on the back of their tractor, um, looking for tips on how to best manage um, the woodlot and do it do that safely. So we we focus on the tractor side of things. But it's again good to have connections with all of you. Um, Mike St. Peter's looks like I'll be following up with you, and we've done some projects with Amanda um, um, Hafey there too. Um, so that's been good good connections to have. Um, and lastly, uh, 10 days from now, I guess I'll officially be taking over the statewide uh, maple um, maple work. So supporting the, the producers throughout the state. So I'm definitely looking for more connections. And starting next month, I'll be reaching out to quite a few of you to talk about you know, sugar bush management um, and, and that side of uh, the forestry spectrum. So 
Um, just really appreciative of the ability to be on the call today, learn more about what's going on, and uh, looking forward to connecting with everybody um, as time goes on. Um, Jason, can I can I make a quick comment? This is Sally Stockwell again from Maine Audubon. I um, one of the projects that we're hoping to do in the next year is bring over work that Vermont Audubon has started in Vermont, working with maple producers and sugar bush producers on what they call um, bird friendly maple. And so I would love to get in touch with you about ways that we might be able to collaborate. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm really interested in those signs as well. Um, we're talking about trying to where the producers weren't able to have a, a maple Maple Sunday or Maple Weekend in March this year. We're talking about a fall event, but at the same time, we're still going to have to have that acti those activities be geared towards the outdoors. So, you know, sugar bush tours with signage seem like a great way to still, you know, you know get that level of interest. So yeah, I love those resources. Great. All right, thanks, Jason. Uh, Amanda Mahaffey was on the call. I don't see her on there now, but if you're there, Amanda. Okay, guess not. Probably had to jump on and jump off. Amanda Mahaffey is a uh, deputy director of the Forest Stewards Guild, and she's partnered on a lot of these things over the years, uh, particularly on the, um, the forestry for Maine birds, but also with uh, women in our woods or uh, women's owning woods uh that that whole initiative if she was here she could say more about that and so again i getting back to uh, any of the folks on for um main forest service mort or dan uh if you want to jump in with with anything that uh that you're working on that uh, folks would want to know about i i see your initials mort go ahead Sure, I'll just say hello and thank you to everyone for um, uh, for connecting with with the stewardship program and in particular for those of you who are working with uh, the individual district foresters or with multiple district foresters. I, uh, we really, really appreciate the, the partnerships that we have and meetings like this just remind me of um, of how many different things are going on that uh, that we're participating in and um, being able to connect with other other agencies and organizations. So um, I'll just uh, again, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, I also just note that uh, in terms of personnel, we now have a new forester in the Jefferson office. Alyssa Gregory started about a month ago, and I'm sure she'll be interested in connecting with a lot of you folks on on different programs that you uh, that, that you're working on, I'm, I'm sure that she'll want to become involved. Um, so we're very happy to have her and uh, we've got a um, one forester who will be out for a little while. Um, so we have a, a couple of uh, holes to fill or temporary uh, gaps, but um, that should hopefully be resolved in the next uh, couple of months. So hopefully I'll have some 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 uh, additional info on that. But um, thanks again for everybody who's who's worked with us and um, yeah, keep the information, keep the, the requests for uh, partnership partnerships, um, referrals to landowners, et cetera. Keep it coming. We're happy to do it. Thanks. OK, well, thank you, Morton. Uh, Dan, anything you want to mention? I know. Uh, Sugar bushes are, are kind of a uh, near and dear to your heart. If you're still on Dan, Yeah, go ahead. I'm here. Uh, can you hear me, Andy? Yeah. I just want to say uh, thank you for letting me participate in the meeting. I got quite a lot out of it. Very informative. A lot of good, a lot of good speakers and a lot of good information. Uh, I'm a district forester. I work in primarily Southern Aroostook County. I've uh, met many of the people on this meeting before, but uh, some I have not. And I work with a wide range of clients, uh, loggers, foresters, and landowners. 
Uh, I work with a wide variety of landowners and um, I refer folks to the appropriate people and the appropriate appropriate programs whenever possible. Uh, one thing I think that I'd like to try to do is increase participation in um, financial assistance for uh, planning, uh, especially the wrap plans. It seems like uh, that is kind of tapered off quite a bit in my district and maybe I need to brainstorm a little bit with Andy on how to increase participation because in my mind it's a valuable program and a good tool and I'd like to see more of those plans getting out there in my district if I can. Um, and I'll have to be in uh, contact with uh, Jason Lilly about the his new role with uh, helping to manage sugar bushes and his new role with maple syrup. So thanks again for having me. I appreciate it. Okay, thank you, Dan. Uh, I just made a little note. Yeah, maybe we need to figure out a way just to remind the foresters and landowners up your way that um, that we do have funds. Um, you know, may, maybe we have somehow communicated that we don't, but we do. Um, we still have funding that we can do those wrap uh, woodland resource action plans, stewardship level plans that also satisfy tree farm and tree growth and any number of uses, uh, purposes that landowners have for getting forest management plans. Um, and I, yeah, I was pretty sure you'd want to connect with Jason about the uh, about the sugar bush, about um, maple syrup. Um, is there anything that anybody else would like to add? Uh, we're actually doing quite well on time. So Jerry, I apologize. I, I might have cut you off a little bit. Was there something that maybe you wanted to bring back uh, that you didn't get a chance to say earlier? Um, I just wanted to continue. The, we used to have a Xerxes partner biologist to help with pollinators. Um, Eric um, Venturi has left, and now we currently uh, have here Mo Ray, I think it's pronounced, I might have butchered it, sorry. Um, but she has started a few weeks ago, so there is that, that resource for pollinator um, habitat if somebody needs that experience. Um, uh, I'll kind of lost my train of thought here. Um, there is several, re uh, RCCP, which is uh, Resource Conservation Partner Programs across the state. Um, the big one I mentioned was the um, St. Croix, it's, no, I'm sorry, Bay of Fundy Aquatic Conductivity. And we have the one with TNC uh, that Sally spoke about. And there's a smaller one that I believe is almost finished. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Sally, but I believe there's still AOP um, chances for sign up for aquatic organism passage through that um, Western Mountain RCPP at least for the next year. Um, <clears throat> Yes, we yeah. we actually have we actually have a little bit of both uh, a funding available both for more cap plans and for AOP aquatic passage projects. Okay, and thank you, Sally. And those are you know some of the uh, the highlights that I guess I I, I kind of cut myself off from. So thanks, Andy, for coming back around. Okay. Well, again, uh, it's it's a little it's a little different to do this when I'm just looking at a list of names <laughs> and not really people. But appreciate everyone's patience, the folks that that hung in there. Um, I'll mention one other sort of initiative or project that the Maine Forest Service is involved in, along with Tree Farm and the Forest Stewards Guild. Uh, we did get some funding from the National Wildlife uh, National Fish and Wildlife. Uh, fund, yeah, NIF WIF, okay, uh, to do some more proactive outreach in eastern Maine, uh, primarily Washington and Hancock counties and parts of uh, Penobscot. And uh, folks, 
that work in that area should be seeing some of those results here in the next few months. We're going to do a um, a mailing to a lot of landowners just in general, hoping to reach the landowners that we don't normally reach or who don't normally think of calling the main fire service for whatever reason, uh, but to let them know that we're here and that we uh, we have district foresters, we have resource professionals and we can help connect them to other resource professionals such as wildlife biologists. So that's something else that we're going to be moving forward on and kind of tied into that um, another initiative that we're very early stages on and that's uh, creating a network of woodland owners, landowners who can be, where you're using the term ambassadors, um, they'll be there to talk to other woodland owners either to come visit them at their woodlots or host them on a visit to the ambassador's woodlot. In, in those cases where for whatever reason the landowner may not be as comfortable right off calling the main forest service or calling even a, a licensed forester uh, because they don't feel ready to talk to an expert, perhaps talking to somebody else that um, has been through that process. Um, we feel like that's, uh, you know, could be the next step for a lot of landowners. So we want to establish a network of those woodland owners that uh, we can refer people to. It's like if you're you know, it's kind of like you're shopping for a car and you want to talk to somebody else who's driven a car like that and find out how that how it worked for them before you actually talk to the salesman. Um, I just came up with that metaphor. I'll have to see if that works. Anyway, uh, that's, that's some of the other things that we're doing at Maine Fire Service. So it's just about that time for wrap up. If you look in the chat, you'll see that at the very beginning of it, I put the uh, a website for our stewardship advisory committee web pages where there's information from past meetings. We'll collect up information, including I think this recording uh, and post it there uh, at some point in the future. Uh, so keep that in mind. And also by going there, you can access the stewardship advisory committee survey, uh, which is which is on there. I mentioned earlier that we're going to be redoing it a little bit and putting it in a different format, but the existing format still is there. Uh, so feel free to go there and that's a place to stuff you may have think of after we sign off, um, go into additional detail about your comments, your suggestions for the program. That's a great place to, to uh, document it. So with that, if anybody else has anything they'd like to say, I, I'll just say thank you for attending and uh, hopefully we'll be able to do this again next year. Maybe even live in person with food. <laughs> All right. Thank, thank you, Andy. Andy. Great program. Thanks, Andy. Goodbye. Thanks, Andy.